looking into Ephesians chapter 5. We had started looking in about verse 3. And we were noticing the list that's there. List of things that should not once be named among the members of the church. Now I would remind you that at the beginning of the chapters we did last week and week before. When he says be ye, that's the imperative. This is the way you must be to be faithful to God. We have a lot of general statements in the scriptures saying being faithful, be thou faithful unto death. I'll give thee a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. Paul herein, as do other writers, is enumerating the specifics of what it is to be faithful. Things to do, things not to do. Of course, he wrote it to the church in Ephesus. We would do well to remember if we didn't know that the churches of Asia, especially in Ephesus, were noted for trying to just bow and scrape, if you'll call it that, to Rome. And if Rome said jump, then they asked how high and when do you want us to come down? We're going to prove to you that we're truly dedicated to the empire of Rome. So the Christians living in Ephesus had to contend with that. I have said this at other times, or haven't said it since we started this, that in the New Testament we probably have more in the way of a record over a period of years of the church of Ephesus than we do of any other New Testament church. We find about its being planted in the, uh, Acts 19. We have Paul calling the elders of the church at Ephesus together at Miletus. Then we find the letter here of the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. And then many, many years later, when the book of Revelation was written, the last book of the Bible, we find one of the seven churches of Asia all of them are the same region as, as Ephesus, but one of those letters is written specifically to the church at Ephesus. They were living in a world as bad as ours and much worse, and yet God expected them to live a faithful Christian life, and here he tells them specifically, you don't do these things. Galatians, he'll say the same thing. Galatians 5, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Very plain. So these things should not be, he will say, named once among the Christians. In our watch over our own lives and the lives of our brethren to make sure we're living correctly, that we don't want to see these things among us. Last week we looked at fornication. We then looked at the uncleanness. And then I think we got down to covetousness, which is idolatry. And I think we also got to the word filthiness. And it has to do with shameful things, things that would disgrace you. Everything that's against purity is the New Testament defines purity in a person's life. Sometimes we sing the song, pure in heart, oh God, help me to be. So that's the attitude of the child of God. Thus, it involves day-to-day -day examination of our lives, all the way from our thoughts to our plans and purposes to how we say what we say and why we say it, the reason we do what we do. We're seeking to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Thus, the remainder of your life, however long it is from the time you obey the gospel, converted to Christ, till the end of your days, you're striving to let Christ be seen living in you by doing the things that God says you ought to do and leaving undone the things that are of this present world. He then talks about after filthiness, he talks about, and this is where we left off last week, he talks about foolish talking. 
This uh, comes from a compound Greek word, morologia, and the word of the text uh, combines moros, which is foolish, with lego, which is to talk, speak. The word moros comes from the Greek word moo, meaning to be silly. It's often referred to as foolish or stupid, dull, and means more than, let me emphasize that, means more than just talk. It's the talk of fools. I suggest, though we won't do it here, we might later on, just take a look at what the Bible says concerning who God calls a fool, because there are different kinds of fools. It is vain talk, empty, worthless talk. And thus Christians don't engage in that. Doesn't mean that people can't, as we would say, pick at one another or have fun with one another. It has to do with the bad side of things. And it has to do with actually put downs where you don't think that person is worth anything, deserves to be picked on, and you bully them. And that's a lot said nowadays. So the filthiness is right along with the foolish talking, covetousness, uncleanness, and fornication. Shouldn't be in any member of the church and is not in the faithful member of the church. Then there's jesting, jesting. It comes from the Greek word you, tropelia. It's from epsilon, umicron, or upsilon rather, means well, comes from trepo, to turn, to turn well. It was once used in the etymology of the word to mean quick movements, meant flexibility, versatility, and so on. But then, as words often do, as it came down the usage through time, it became or began to be mean, coarse, jesting, buffoonery. And it's used only in a bad sense. I will pause here and say this regarding word studies. It's always interesting to see the etymology of the word in the sense of how it started. And then as time goes on and we use it, it changes. Let's take our English word prevent. When you see it in the King James Version, prevent means go before. But today, prevent means uh, do what you can to stop it. So a living language always has words that are dropped or they're changing meaning or new words added. This may also refer to uh, smuttiness, derision, scoffing, pornography, vile language, any kind of lewdness, indecency, all sorts of other terms that would fit that kind of conduct. This watch that should be in your life and mine and is in the faithful child of God's life is for those who have become saints. It gives more meaning to the word saint, one who's sanctified, one who's set apart, suitable for the master's service. If you're set apart by your conversion and you're suitable, therefore, in that your sins, the old sins have been forgiven, you've been added to the church by the Lord, you're now in the realm of the saved, you have all spiritual blessings and heavenly places that are in Christ, so you live on that level. You live on, let's put it this way, it's simple. You live on the New Testament level. You live on the teaching that goes on in that, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. So this is the, the, the idea of saints. This is the Greek word hagios, and it means holy ones. Do you think of yourself, as the New Testament describes it and defined it, as a holy one? We should. Holy means basically dedicated to something. Well, the church is dedicated to God, first, foremost, and always through Jesus Christ. Basically, this word refers to those who are separated. That's the reason saint is so closely connected to the idea of being holy because it means separated from sin and 
we're consecrated to God. We're God's. We belong to him. That's the point made by Paul, Romans 6, and I've quoted verses, verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that you were the servants, the slaves to sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin. You became the servants, the slaves to righteousness. Jesus has purchased us. We belong to him. We acknowledge that when we, from the heart, obey the gospel. So this seems to be a divine command. If it's not, I don't know what he has to say to make it one. When it comes to the lives and the particular lives of believers. So if you're really sanctified, if you're really a holy person, then your conduct is regulated. Second Timothy one nine, First Peter one fifteen, many other passages. You would say that we're engaged in a life that is God likeness, and that's the way it ought to be. That's the way it's meant to be. When Peter talked about the end of the world. And the dissolving of all these things that make up material and time and space, they don't want to exist anymore. Then he says, how should that affect you as a member of the church? You should strive harder than ever to be like Christ as it's presented in the scriptures. So that covers these things that should not be once named among us, and it's imperative, it's a must, that they not be named once among us. It is uh, simply looking at component parts of what it is to be faithful. Well, we now move to verses 5 and 6. But we still secure our thought and our viewpoints on the basis of, of verse 4. But now these things are what we would call befitting, as King James says, convenient. There again is one of those places where the word is changed. Uh, convenient means when it's easy to do without any effort on my part. Well, at one time it didn't mean that. It means befitting. If you're a Christian, you can tell it. That bumper sticker circulated many years ago. I haven't seen it lately. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, he's showing us the evidence in the fruit you bear out in your life. I might point out that a lot of people regulate fruit bearing to converting people to Christ. Well, it's a part of it. But we just read through a whole system here showing that your life and the way you live, things you do and don't do, also is fruit bearing. Fruit bearing is not limited to converted people, converting people to Christ. It never has been. Now, befitting, as the American Standard says, and convenient, as the King James says, is anikonta, is from aniko, and it relates to that which is not proper, fitting, and does not occur with the person's duties, privileges, and as far as our case is concerned, as being God's children. In the next place, second place, this kind of person has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. That echoes what's said in Galatians 5 about those who engage constantly in making a part of their being the works of the flesh. Verse 5 uh, makes it clear at the end of it that notice hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So we know when people who are members of the church do these things, they're in sin. They have left the faith. They're cut off from God. They're not in fellowship with God anymore. Now we have our duty as faithful to God set upon us. If any man be overtaken in a trespass, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So that's an important matter. But nevertheless, that means that the people who are not us can see how we are and the fruit we bear. There are only two kinds of fruit you can bear. Sinful fruit, righteous fruit. And in obeying Paul, as he said, that we ought to examine ourselves, see whether we be in the faith. I can know whether I am what, I, what God says I ought to be. 
of what God says I shouldn't be. I can know that. If not, how would anybody ever know to respond to the invitation of Christ? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You have to have the ability to be objective with yourself and see things in your life that are good and wholesome. You want to build those up, keep growing in them. But then those things in your life that are sinful, like we've read here, and you get rid of them because it's imperative if you're to be faithful that they be found there because they're the only ones that's going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord when the day of judgment comes. This word inheritance is the Greek kleronomian. It's from two words, kleros, and then nemomai, to possess. It's used actually as a real estate term in the papyri and other places. That which is passed from father to son, sort of his inheritance, Matthew 21, 38, Luke 12, 13. But now as it's used here, it refers to the possessions of the believer in the new age and what the believer will be to God. Acts 20, 32. Back over in Ephesians 1, verse 14, Colossians 3, verse 24, and there are a number of other passages. Now in the third place, Paul says that these things bring the wrath of God up on us. We don't want to see the wrath of God. I don't even, even if I, as I try to understand the love of God and the glory of God, I can't conceive of how terrible the wrath of God will be. I get an idea of it when I see him destroying the world by water. When I see him destroying the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And knowing why he did it. Then when I see him using the children of Israel to purge the land of Canaan. I do know that he does that only when his suffering long with them is ended because they just simply refuse to repent and change. This wrath is the word orge. It's often called anger. Hebrews 3.11, 4 and 3 and Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans 9 and verse 22. In other places, it's used several places. So this is the kind of thing we don't want coming from God directed toward us. Now the ultimate anger of God or wrath of God is, depart from me, I never knew you into the everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. There's no way we can really look deeply into that in our finite minds, no matter how much Bible we know and how able we put it into practice, and realize the consuming fire that's eternal of the Lord. For our God is a consuming fire. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, it's not to the faithful child of God. It's not to the one who is truly holy, one who is a saint, one who has spent their life in the church trying to think only good thoughts and setting their affections on things above, which means not literally above our head, but above means how God wants you to live. Remember in the model prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, in heaven it's flawlessly done. And we labor then to bring ourselves in subjection to Christ. And that's what Paul meant that he had done all his life when he says, I have fought the good fight of faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of life. Well, that's what we all should be able to say. So when you look at the why of these things, I would say that, that they are things that rob the Christian of his inheritance. If you knew you had an inheritance of many thousands, millions, possibly dollars, lands and houses. Uh, yet it was contingent upon your conduct. Wouldn't you be particular about your conduct? Well, we have that which is far more valuable than the whole world. What shall a man give in exchange of his soul? 
And a whole host of folks cannot see eternity because they don't know the Word of God. You cannot see eternity like God wants people on earth to see eternity if you're ignorant of the Bible. Because seeing eternity through the eye of faith, and remember faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, is to allow me to want to go to heaven, to have the expectation of heaven. And nobody has a right to expect heaven or to think it's going to be theirs if they're not divesting themselves of these things. Paul says should not be once named among us. And then practicing those things that characterize a faithful child of God. So while it's so very important, and it's not being done a lot today like it once was for various reasons, that the church realized the Great Commission to preach the gospel to every creature, being that the gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, then it's so much more important to keep those people that are converted to Christ, that have been baptized into Christ, faithful. It's just been something that's bothered me, if you want to know the way I think about it, all my life. I've seen pushes made to convert people to get out and study with people. Well, that's all well and good. I don't think enough of that's done. The gospel is given into our hands. We are expected to be the mouth of God and the hands of God and the feet of God. We're to teach the truth to those who don't know it. We're to be busy about it and zealous in it. But it's always seemed once we got them in the baptistry and got them out, uh, that's it. I've often thought, and some of us won't know what this is about, but have you ever seen animals that were dipped in a dipping vat for the purpose of killing vermin that lived on them? And when they come out, they just go every direction. I sometimes think that's about the way it is when you baptize somebody into Christ with some people. Well, we got them baptized, and who knows where they're fleeing to. <laughs> they just run here and there and yon because they're not taught more specifically, and nurtured as babes in Christ. But yet that's all a part of our being faithful and to set the godly example, the example of a holy one, of a saint, he's telling us right here because remember this is written to the church at Ephesus, not to people outside the church. The only way this applies to people outside the church is to say if you become a Christian, here's what God expects of you. So, we don't see that. We don't put the emphasis there as we ought to. You see that it has to do with this word, the why, or having to do with why we do these things. We thwart, we hinder, we put a stumbling block of some way before the very design of the gospel, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. We're pictured as grieving the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. That is no mystical thing. Now you can find that to grieve the Holy Spirit is to grieve God. Well, what? what brings grief to God, to put it on a human level so we can understand what's going on? Our sins. That's what causes God to have grief. This is another one of those wonderful things to understand about the writing of the Bible. God doesn't have those human attributes, but he speaks on our level. And so we can understand somebody grieving over something. He'll also talk about quenching the spirit. And before grieving, you'll find that it talks about tempting the spirit. Well, what does that mean? Well, at the end of it, when it talks about quenching the Spirit, the power of the Spirit has no more influence over you. It's like pouring water on a fire. It's gone. It can't burn. Well, I have that power. I can hear the truth, recognize it, intellectually understand it, know this means me, but I can reject it. I don't know how to get that across to us other than what's said of the Holy Spirit himself. We're to war, these things war against the soul. That is, they, they stop us from living on that spiritual plane because they anchor us to the here and now. And the thing that comes out here in verse 6, they provoke God to anger. Have you ever had your parents back when you were home 
get angry with you? I think probably we, we have, unless we were living in some sort of strange place. <laughs> because they have jurisdiction over us. They have a right to guide us. I'm not talking about any kind of abusive conduct. I'm talking about the corrective discipline. The Bible teaches the responsibility of parents along with instructional discipline, rearing them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, we're children of God. Can we anger God? Well, we have an Old Testament example. The children of Israel, fleshly Israel, angered God. All those thousands that came out of Egypt, only two that were 20 years old and up were to enter the land of Canaan, Joshua and Caleb. Because God was angry with them. We must understand God is a just God as well as a loving God. Right now we're in the period of probation. God has granted us this through his long suffering. I can show God I love him. I can show everybody else around that I love him. I can show God I have faith in him and his system of salvation. I can show everybody around me that I do. How? I live like he tells me to live. I teach what he tells me to teach. And thus I show that I am on God's side. That's something sometimes maybe we don't think about. But everybody in this room and everybody in this world is either on God's side or the devil's side. Now, if you think there's some other side, what is it? And thus everybody's a child of God, or here's where the majority lies, a child of the devil. And we need to understand that it's the straight and narrow way of truth that leads us to heaven. If one will only think of Sodom and Gomorrah and realize that God's wrath will be completely realized in the future final judgment of all men, Hebrews 10, 30, and 31, then the why of our abstinence from these things will be clearly realized. You see, we are children, some of us more mature maybe than others, but we don't know alone what's good for us. Now, we see some of these things posted in cartoons and maybe on Facebook and other places of some little child who has got in and ate all of the candy they possibly can eat. They don't know any better. It's not good for them. They just had an opportunity and they could do it and nobody was there to stop them. Well, this sounds awful gruesome and it is, but I don't know but to one extent or the other that this hasn't happened to all little kids when they're up running around the diaper and they do a baddie in that diaper and you're not around and they decide to paint the bathroom. Now, why do they do that? Is it good for them? They don't know one way or the other. You do. Well, if we can understand that, why can't we understand God's our Heavenly Father knows what to hold us back from and knows what to put us into? Have you ever seen the baby when it's fretting, carrying on, and the mother, being the wise mother and learning mother, says, oh, you need to go to sleep. Because babies will fight sleep. And so she gets it up and she sits down and she just a little bit, it's down to sleep. Well, I'd like to think that God knows us at least as well as a good mother knows her baby. And on and on you can go in that way. So it's an important point to keep in mind. The warning seems to come from verses 5 and 6 and 7. King James has ye know. And the word know is the Greek word genos kontes and is a present active participle. Nominative plural masculine. 
And it comes to us from the word gnosko. If you ever took Greek your first week, you probably have to know the alphabet and the diphthongs and so forth and all of that. That'll be one of the first words you'll know. Is uh, Interesting, you'll know. Is gnosko. It means to come to know, to come to understand, to realize, to take knowledge. You know, there are some people in the most important things in the world never come to know it. Never take knowledge. Never understand. Never realize. So there's no doubt or question about the whereabouts in the after a while of those who engage in these items that we just mentioned in verses 3 and 4. It, they're not going to go to heaven when they practice these things. And they're not going to heaven when they leave undone sins of omission the things God obligates us to do. Now, the word is so strong that the word surety, that's a guarantee, surety, guarantee, was placed by the American, trans, American Standard Translators in this. Just as Christ is the personal guarantee of the terms of the new and better covenant, so the word of God is that to us relative to what it takes to inherit the kingdom of God. As I say, so many of us think, well, he was baptized into Christ. Don't know what he did thereafter, but he was baptized into Christ for the remission of sin. And some people think, well, that's it. It's the beginning, not the ending. It's the beginning, not the ending. When newborn babes in Christ, you don't leave a baby all on its own. You nurture it, teach it. And our second thought for the warning comes from the word a patato. I didn't say potato, but it sounds like that, a patato. It comes from the word apatao, and it means to cheat, to deceive, to beguile, and other such ways of describing. And it's used of those who would belittle the true character. And the final result of the sins that we just previously mentioned. You cannot practice those things and expect heaven. And a doctrine, any doctrine that says you can is making light of what God said because you can't. When such people approach us, we would say they're the sons of disobedience or the sons of night. We need to remember that they only give unto us empty words. Empty words. And the word for empty is from the Greek word kinois, from kinos, and expresses the hollowness. An absence is um, which otherwise might be possessed. And in this passage, it is here used of words which convey the wrong meaning of teaching. Now, let me emphasize that. I'm going to close here. Words which convey the wrong meaning of teaching. Baptism. Going back to the Greek word baptizo and just the general comments in the New Testament concerning the meaning of baptizo. Baptizo means to immerse or to plunge beneath. You can see it without knowing the Greek because Colossians 2.12 and Romans 6.3 and 4 calls baptism a burial. Yet people will tell you it's just a sprinkling of water on somebody. Or the pouring of water on somebody. Or they will tell you, yes, you should be immersed in water, but not in order to be saved from your past sins, but because you were saved the moment you believe. Now that's just an example of words that people used that convey the wrong meaning or teaching and that get you away from what the Bible actually says. So I close on this point. If the devil gets me, or the devil gets you, or the devil gets anybody, he must get us away from the word of truth. 
He must get us away from the pure doctrine of Christ, the gospel of Christ. He must convince us that I can live in a way that the Bible says I shouldn't live. Because he must get us to sin and to live in that sin and to turn a deaf ear to the truth. We sang a song a moment ago, Brett Led, where it talks about the mighty fortress is our God. But in one of those stanzas it says, let all these earthly things go, family, even our life in the flesh and the affairs of this world. Let it all go if those things are to keep us from being faithful to God. I don't think a lot of people understand how far God expects us to go to be faithful to Him. We should, but we don't. Well, I'm going to close here. It seems a good place to close. To think about if Christ did all that Christ did to save us from our sins, sacrificed all that could be sacrificed, and died on the cross of Calvary, He has the right to expect from us certain things and thus we must count the cost of discipleship if you're not a child of God we studied in this sermon what to do to become one and really the whole sermon has been about what it is to be converted to Christ to live the Christian life to be faithful and itemize those things that should not be once named among the faithful as a child of God if some of these things or other sins are named among you well, if you still love the Lord or you'll renew that love, then there'll be godly sorrow toward God, in other words, for your sins against Him that moves you to repentance and you'll turn from them, come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. So if you're subject to the good, blessed invitation of our Lord while God's given us time to once more have an opportunity to change our lives for the better, will you come while we stand and sing?